May Brahman, the reality, protect us. May Brahman sustain us. May Brahman illumine our thinking process. May we not find fault with each other, with the world, or with the teachings. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om. We have come back after the second half of our class and are, uh, I mean, to the second half of our class to encounter another element of the Jnana Matra. And we talked about the Guru Bhakti petal of the lotus. And now we want to look more towards these, this side of the chart, the Samanya Vijnana, settling wisdom. Be more like kind of contentment that happens. Um, uh, a little bit more on Arupa Vinasha, that is, um, or Mano Nasha, the destruction of form, the idea of form in the mind. It's one of the things that the yogi has a very hard time, the aspiring yogi has a very hard time doing, is to get beyond that fifth level of yoga called Pratyahara, not only uh, taking the senses off of the objects, but taking the subtle senses off of the inner objects. That is, stop thinking about them so much. We talked about getting that resolve around that, and that ability to do that is very freeing, to be free of thinking about things all the time. First it's brooding, maybe some intellection kind of going on, uh, and then eventually it turns into uh, what's called um, sukshma dhyan. Your mind is always considering the teachings. Uh, that's my problem, I think. <coughs> Welcome to my problem. I'm always considering the teachings and they're always going on in my mind. And that's been a huge help to me in uh, achieving contentedness, settled wisdom, peace of mind, equanimity, and so forth. But I realize that there are higher places to put the mind uh, than, than wisdom teachings. Basically, you want to try and go from the seated samadhis, samadhis of wisdom and knowledge and samadhis of bliss, to unseated asampragyata samadhis, which are formless. And so lots of things can detain the aspirant. At a lower level, occult powers can detain many, many aspirants by getting too much involved in those things, the tricks of prana, Sri Ramakrishna used to call it, too much um, obsession with ritual, as we talked about in the bhakti path, could also detain the aspirant in their, in their inner journey. And so as you go up the spectrum, in the spectrum that is, inward ascension we call it, then you come to this land of wisdom, jnana kasha. And uh, at that level of jnana kasha, the space of wisdom, you get much enamored of that. It, it's sort of like savichara and savitarka samadhis in in Patanjali's Father of Yoga's way of, of saying is that you see all the wisdom within you and then you get struck by it and you're uh, lost in it. And if you then are able to pull back from that state of being lost in it and, and begin to concentrate on little particles of it one by one, then you have a much higher state of realization and you realize that you can go on doing this forever. It's contemplating your own wisdom, you say these words and it 
you know, then there's some outer understanding comes from those words. But what's really happening is this sage, the seer, the rishi, the yogi, the adept, the luminary, are all really lost in those. And they're a level of consciousness. They're a samadhi. And basically, they're samadhi of objects, aren't they? I and mean, people, when they're, you know, doing computers and iPads and various things like this, they get into them, cell phones even. <laughs> a little tiny thing can attract your full attention all day, can't it? So it's a kind of samadhi. It's a samadhi of a physical object. There's also a samadhi of the body. And there's a samadhi of a chapati to the Mexican. <laughs> there's a samadhi of food. <laughs> I Chris, because he gets my jokes and laughs at them. You see. So they all can. All states of consciousness are a kind of samadhi. Um, if they end quickly and lead to suffering, then you know that they're not very high. But at that level of jnana wisdom or jnana uh, agni, the fire of wisdom, or um, atma jnana, the wisdom of the self, not the ego self, of course, not the anatman, but the paramatman, the supreme self, which is transcendent and absolute, then that's a kind of higher samadhi that one can not only uh, abide in, we call it abiding in the Atman, but can also use to transfer teachings to others, to transmit them. It's, dif it's different than just teaching in a s classroom or something, a school, at different levels of secular education. Uh, it's actually a wisdom transmission that's going on, and that's all stream of particles. Those stream of particles are coming out of our eyes as a kind of energy and looking at each other. We see each other and we, we connect or we don't. We avoid the gaze or we look. Um, whatever the case may be, it is a stream of energy. That's kind of prana that we feel. Like if somebody's looking at you, you feel it. And then you look over there. What do I feel? And people don't usually question it, but it's a kind of uh, particle of the attention of another person that's streaming at you. So it's, it's more on the level of intuition at that level. But beyond intuition, there's insight and, and, uh, and uh, then wisdom insight. So that you know what the teaching you're hearing or you're reading is transmitting to you and it inspires you very deeply. And then you connect with it. So that stream of wisdom particles is uh, at different levels, I'm saying. If it's, you're at that level of a kind of inner samadhi, then you're very close to uh, chiddakasha. That is, jnanakasha, the space of wisdom, is lying right up, hand in glove, to this chiddakasha, the space of spirit, which is actually beyond space, as we can reckon it. It's where the sugar cube has already melted into the cup of tea. There's no more granules left. The granules would be, there's still some wisdom particles there that you're involved in. And then when the sugar cube is still broken into four chunks, then you know there's the four states of your consciousness and you're contemplating those. Or when it's just one solid lump, if you just drop it in, you know, it, there's, there's just the body basically. There's this idea of materiality and, and sensuality. So as the sugar cube dissolves in that tea, it becomes one homogeneous liquid, then you've reached a state of witness consciousness. And that's what this petal is about, this wisdom fire that dissolves and the actual dissolving power itself plus the sakshi chaitanya the consciousness that witnesses it came up several times in the first half of our class today for instance very interesting to meditate on on my deaths I mean if you start out meditating on my death in this lifetime I will die that's not a morbid meditation according to Vivekananda and others that's something that's very healthy for your spiritual life that I will die. This personality complex will end. And it's just a matter of then, uh, where will it go? Or who am I? Uh, it leads to deeper and, and, and more noble lines of questioning, spiritually speaking. Atma, vichara, inquiry into the nature of your true self, rather than thinking all the time or brooding upon your non-self. Your non-self is five elements congealed and into flesh and bone and marrow and blood and, and body and, and a mental complex is also a part of your non-self, your thinking process, your ego, your intelligence, that is your, your basic intelligence, your everyday intelligence, and your uh, thoughts. You know, they're all, uh, they're all kind of a mental complex. 
you also want to dissolve that with this particle. You, know, you, you, you can turn a stream of those particles on it and dissolve it, like a laser on a cancer. And the whole thing is sankalpa, and projection of the mind. So Krishna says to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, sankalpa is a positive evil. You should learn how to turn it off. So to turn it off and turn it on at will would be the adept yogi's uh, attainment. You can plug into your own sankalpa. What are you desiring? What are you suffering from? What do you want? What is your desire? What is your highest good? Sort of in a line of succession like that. And find out where you are at in attaining those things and help you. And therefore, he's engaging in a sankalpic process too, but for an entire, entirely different reason than the student is or the average everyday person is. But to be able to turn it off is the important thing, the dissolving power. And that stream of particles is so potent. It's just like pouring, pouring uh, acid on, on, a, on a Kleenex. So it's just, it's going to burn right through immediately and dissolve everything. So you're, you should be in control. You should be in power, have that power in yourself because it is within you and you should be able to wield it like a weapon against anything that's intrusive. So the power of brooding is there, then dissolve the very power to brood. Don't try and dissolve the things that you're brooding on because that's going about it ass backwards, as they say. Cart before the horse. Get to the source of what's doing the brooding and then you'll ask yourself, am I the brooder? Or am, am I the uh, dissolver of all things that, such as brooding or guilt or fear or doubt or any of the other things that make up that curtain of unknowing, that cloud of unknowing, curtain of nations we're talking about. So very unique abilities in the yogic sphere that the yogi is in, in, in uh, possession of. That's what makes that person, yogi or yogini, so attracting. Like when we saw my teacher, very attained, then we would just look at him and say, I want to be like that. Just like a little kid wanting to be like his father when he grows up. Spiritually speaking, it's much the same way. When you see the yogis or the rishis, even if you even read about them, or you, you hear what they were you know, talking about or, or what they read what they wrote down, you're just saying, why can't I be like that? You see, there's some growth to be made here. Some, I need to undergo some training. I need to qualify myself. So when that qualification matures, then you have this beautiful witness consciousness that comes to the fore, Sakshi Chaitanya. And I want to talk about that. And in relationship to the settling wisdom too, because um, I, for instance, you had these beautiful music. Aham nirvikalpa nirakara rupa viva twacha sarvatra sarvendriya nam nacha sangatam naiva mutir namea Chirananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham Chirananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham first sang that verse and five others to my teacher for the first time when I offered music at his ashram, he said, that's the best of India. He impressed it upon me. It's called the Nirvana Shatkam, the six verses of Nirvana, or Asampragyata, or Nirvikalpa, the highest samadhi, where witness consciousness dwells. And it says, uh, Aham, I am Nirvikalpa. I am samadhi. It's not something I'm going to get later or something I want or something that can be attained. It doesn't leave any doubt. Aham nirvikalpa. Nirvikalpa, if you're in Vedantic circles, you know that is the 
thing. That is the essence. Nirvikalpa is it. Nirvi, extinction of all kalpas, of all imaginings, of all thoughts, of all projections, of all fears, of all doubts, even of all good things. Being to, to go beyond good and bad, or any duality that's there. For instance, like form and formlessness. That's a very high duality. Or bondage and liberation. How about that one? You see, because I'm always, you know, fancying one and and haunted by the other. So it's a kind of brooding at a high level. You see, it's like like brooding goes away, just because I stop thinking about you know my loved ones dying in the hospital or I'm, my my death is imminent or even brooding about silly things that that are just a waste of time. So it's aham nirvikalpa. I am the highest state of consciousness. Nirakara rupa. I'm the very form of non-action. No, no action. I am beyond the senses and the mind. And uh, I, uh, transcendent of all names and forms. Nirakara rupa. And so that kind of verse put down in Sanskrit words is an expression of the highest wisdom. There's probably no better way to put it down than that. First, somebody meditated, they had the realization, they somehow brought, came down out of that meditation and put it into some very powerful words, jnana, filled with jnana matras. And then they sat down and put some tones to it and sang it to you. And if that didn't bring tears to your eyes and cause you to remember, cause you to remember everything that's in your causal memory, deep, deep, deep. I would say back inside of your subconscious is your unconscious, but I'm sorry, Freud and Jung did not know much about this yogic wisdom. They never had oriental people on their therapy table who believed in many lifetimes. The West has been operating under the one lifetime scenario for thousands of years. Its religion is, or to going to heaven somewhere, you know, after death. But the Vedanta does not care for heaven, does not care for a post-mortem emancipation. The liberation is now. Freedom is now. There's a difference between being and becoming. And if you're lost in becoming, then you're lost in sankalpa, vikalpa, and all its repercussions. But if you know yourself to be, then you say, Aham nirvikalpa. I am that state of consciousness. I'm the highest state of consciousness, the highest state of awareness. So here are a few words that we could put out of this vast Sanskrit language called Devabhasya, the language of the gods, in which a whole race, cross-section of a whole race, got illumined. One of the, the most amazing phenomena in our recorded history is how the age of the rishis with the Vedic age that gave rise eventually to Buddhism and uh, you know, yoga and uh, Vedanta and Sam Samkhya earlier on and all these great souls that came out of it contributed in various ways to this store of words, of very precious words that I would say consist of mainly the Jnana Matra. I mean, you can't really say something like Nirvikalpa or Saksha Chaitanya or Kutasta or Antaryami or Pratyagatman and expect there to be any shred of worldliness or ignorance in it, you see. It's like a sun that shines and there's no darkness around it. So if you say one of these words, where are you going to find anything that isn't profound in it? Mm -hmm. One word then can enlighten you because it's especially a word that is full of jnana matras, streams of consciousness, particles of intelligence. You, you learn to live on that. You learn to digest it. Uh, it's like refining the automobile. First, diesel, <laughs> which is more expensive right now than any other gas or something. <laughs> then regular, see, then unleaded, then silver, see. then rocket fuel. See. So you're developing different levels of particle. Your, your mind is working its way inward in a transcendent fashion to this state of consciousness based on this gradation of particles. Now we know going outward is not doing it for us. 
we went so far outward that we found out that there are particles outward in objects. And we think that by studying the internal side of the external object that we're finding the internal? No, we're finding the further external. The tree, its leaf, its cell, examine it with an electron microscope, and you're finding particles that are changing the beginning of the second. They're called atomic particles, subatomic particles, neutrons, quarks, so forth. That's as far out as you can go. In other words, you make a conclusion there and say, oh, I see, it's all shifting sand. It's all changing particles. It's, as we said last week in the chart on the, ob on the object, two very important things to know about it. One, that it's empty, means of substance, and two is that it cannot fulfill you. Why can't it fulfill you? Because it came from you. It's already yours. It's within you as a stream of particles, a stream of internal particles that gave way to an expression which now host and hold a whole collection of external particles. You don't want to go there. It's like looking out in space. You're just looking at particles. The planets might as well be particles to you. The suns might as well be particles. It's what they mean that you want to know, not what they seem to be. There's the virat. There's the cosmic form. It's made of planets and suns. This is the physical form of God. It's not like they, tried, they wanted to renounce the world in that way. They looked at the whole world and called it the body of God. The whole universe is the body of God, but it's the virat body. It's the changing Brahman. You haven't met the unchanging Brahman yet. And that's what the spiritual aspirant does. He turns on his heel and he moves inside in involution fashion, away from the evolution, because he wants to know the truth. He doesn't want to get sucked so far out that he begins to substitute an outer truth for an internal verity, and then begins to fall victim to suffering with particles. Trees go away, forest fires come, food gets scarce. I saw pictures from space and from an airplane my brother sent me the other day all up and down the northwest coast where our ashrams are, completely brown and barren. No snow, no, no, no snow on Shasta, a haze hanging over the whole coastline. Just brown, not green anymore, and, and not white, no ice. So this is the changing Brahman. I'm not going to become environmentalist because all these worlds exist with me and I can create as many more as I want. But I should get my consciousness together first so that when I create the world with my brothers and sisters, we can sustain it. Vishnu sustains, Brahma creates, Shiva destroys. We're not engaging in Sankalpa with some sort of um, uh, uh, misconception that we're creating something eternal. We know it's going to change. That's the, unchan that's the changing Brahman out there. We accept it. See, we're, we're rationalists, we're practical. We won't get attached to the object. Yoga is all about detaching from the object, isn't it? Because we've got an unholy, unholy relationship going on with it. The seer has become the scene, become identified with the scene. That's, that's the Kali Yuga when that happened. But what about Aham Nirvikalpa Nirakara Rupa? And what about Jirananda Rupa? Shivo ham, Shivo ham. I am Shiva. I am Shiva. Om. Don't forget to say Om at the end. With an M, with a long M. Mm. That's the dissolving power. A is the beginning, U is the sustaining, M is... It is the word. There's no better word. There is no other word in all the worlds or in any religion like Om. It's perfect. That's why you have Shalom and you have, you have Amin, Omin, you see, Amin, Omin, Amen. You have all these beautiful A-U-M sounds that are associated with the most powerful words in any tradition. Omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, the three Oms I call them. Doesn't matter what language you go to, you'll find those associated with the very most 
pregnant and profound words. And that's what we have here in this chart that I'm showing you, these different levels of consciousness. So, aham nirvikalpa, I am that. What is that that I am? Because one of the great sayings says, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. So that's even more direct. Let's cut to the chase here. God, man, kind of just God walking around on two legs. He is Brahman. Have you seen any other God in this world but, but human beings? If you're still worshiping dolphins and whales, forget it. Nothing that special about them. They haven't even got a human body yet. A, ba a man is born to no purpose who, having been given the boon of a human body, is unable to realize God. Mm -hmm. You see, it's human beings that transcend the physical condition, like Buddha under the bow tree or Christ in the wilderness. They can realize the intelligent particle and use it to dissolve the worlds of name and form in time and space. They don't just live in water. They live in water and on land and in the air and in space. You might have noticed. They're even on the moon sometimes. So this is the expression of God. When you look out, you're just seeing nothing but God everywhere at all times. All this Brahma. Aham nirvikalpa. So these are four words I've chosen here with some Upanishadic slokas that correlate very definitely with this petal or this element of Sakshi Chaitanya, witness consciousness, which is a part of your intelligent cell. There's a part of you that is magnificent in that it can take an overview of everything at all times. It can get out of the river of time. It can transcend the five akashas of space, and it does. And so it can see everything that's happening in them. And it can, it can dissolve name and form without any fear, and can also take them back without any trepidation. Well, maybe there's a little trepidation taking them back. <laughs> Even the seers, when they think about having to come into the physical body, sweat a little. I'm going down there where even, no matter whether you're an ant or an avatar, you suffer. And in fact, Holy Mother Sri Sharda Devi, our Ishtam of this ashram, said in that regard that, that uh, all beings come here in all forms, no matter what form is taken, have to undergo that suffering. So I hope you'll never be born again here, she said. She told us that once. Hope you'll never have to be born again here on earth. So he wasn't pulling any punches. Whether you understand it or believe it or not, there are a host, a plethora of illumined souls whose ideal is transworldly, is otherworldly. And I'm not talking about heaven when I say that, because they want to go beyond heaven too. Heavens and earths and hells are all form, so they're all maya. But these levels of consciousness transcend those. They're a state of mind, or maybe you should call it a state of no mind, mm -hmm. a state of no mind, where even thinking has uh, stopped. Uh, you know, as Vivekananda once said humorously, humorously, God is brainless, but he's, <laughs> he's fooling us with these little brains. But next time I won't be caught sleeping. So I've found out that this brain is limited, that this mind also is limited. It's to be transcended, uh, that my natural state is, I am Brahman, or I am nirvikalpa. I am the extinction, nirvana, as Buddha put it, of all thought processes, from the highest concepts on down to manifesting the five elements in a physical world. So here we get to more of the essence of the Advaita Vedanta, where this class has been leading us, all these preliminary teachings leading up to it, all these different elements of bhakti and of memory and practices and so forth, can't quite cut it when you come to Advaita Vedanta trying to express it. But words like these can. Let's take them from the bottom up. Sakshi is that word here on this chart. Sakshi Chaitanya, of all the words in Sanskrit that mean consciousness, Chaitanya is probably one of the best. Chaitanya was also one of the greatest realized God-men around 1400s, I think. What great 
Vaishnava luminary. Uh, and uh, so there are representations of Chaitanya beyond and with form. Now, if you want to understand the word Sakshi, then let's look at these, um, some of these quotes out of the Upanishads, because the Upanishads are the superlative and author authoritative teachings. They're, they're what you want to know. Uh, then when we said the four qualifications to the teacher, one of them is Shrotriya, that means she'd really communicate to you and transmit to you the essence of the teachings. Those are going to be Upanishads and a few other prime choice scriptures like the Brahma Sutras and Bhagavad Gita and so forth. The Ashana Triam, they call it, the three great landmarks in scriptural history in India. Gita, Upanishads, and Brahma Sutras. Very, very non-dual powerful scriptures. So out of these Upanishads, we take some of these great teachings because remember, if you're a Vedantist, then Vedanta means Upanishad, straight out. Veda Anta, the end of the Vedas. The end of the Vedas are the section called the Upanishads. So if you're a Vedantist or if you're interested in Vedanta, read the Upanishads. Start with 11 of them and then take the other 99 later, if you can. But 11 of them were commented by Shankara, same person who sang Aham Nirvikalpa, by the way, gave us these Upanishads in very good commentaries around 700 AD. So this particular quote says, and I'll read it for you, as the spider emits and withdraws its web, as herbs sprout from the soil of the earth, and as the hair grows on the head without any effort, so from the imperishable being, the universe springs forth. From the infinite, the finite has come idea again. So all of those little metaphors or illustrations, uh, like the spider on its web and so forth, Give us the idea that there's something looking on to all this massive phenomena. This mass of phenomena, Sakshi Bhutam. Bhuta means forms, especially gross forms. Bhutas can also mean spirits, like ghosts and so forth. This whole realm of Bhutas, the Bhuta Kasha, means this realm of unreal things, basically, that are empty, but they look solid. Isn't it? They're, they look solid, but if you analyze them down to their core, you find them changing particles. So to see through appearances is one of the first uh, predirectives and prerogatives of the yogic aspirant. Wants to get in there and be a Sherlock Holmes of the inner realms. And we're, that's really more about Antaryami, but we're getting there soon. Um, this is the self-luminous witness of all beings and phenomena in relativity. And so it's the reality that looks upon the, uh, all of the relative universes in space and time. Also could say, cognizer of the presence and absence of knower knowledge and knowable. There's a nice tree putti for you. If you sat down and you think there's the knower, there's knowledge, and then there's what's knowable, then you probably say there has to be a witness to those. You could say, well, isn't the knower the witness? But he's the knower of the knowledge which is usually associated with objects, isn't it? Most beings are, are trying to look for knowledge in form. But what about the witness of consciousness? That's the witness of a formless state that is anterior to life and mind. That's what the Mundaka Upanishad says. Anterior to life and mind is the Atman the witness. You know what the word anterior means, I presume. That happened before. Happened before what? Life and mind. What to speak of bodies and worlds, because bodies and worlds, we're saying, came out of mind as projection power by the intelligent particle. Streams, stream of consciousness. Like a beam of light. Only this light is sentient light filled with particles, illuminating effect. Put it anywhere and it lights up whatever you want to know. Samyama. Those of you who are taking the Raja Yoga study course that SRV is offering have been studying those sutras in yoga on Samyama.
meditate on an elephant, he says, and you get the idea of great power. But you could also say, meditate, meditate on the germ, because the germ kills the elephant. Mm. Tiny little germ can, tell it, can, can kill a huge monstrous beast, you see. So what's very, very subtle, what's even causal, that the yogi turns his mind upon. Looks back inside. Let's look at this next word, kutasta. Kutasta means a kind of substratum, indivisible substratum, an underlying foundation. This is advaitic, spiritually speaking. A dancer needs a stage if you want to put it in more relative terms. Head needs, uh, hair needs head to grow on, see, as they were just saying. Uh, uh, plants need a world and soil to grow out of. So there's an underlying substratum to any given thing. What about the underlying substratum to all of form? That's kutasta. The quote here is, the Atman, hidden in all beings, reveals itself not to everyone, but is seen only by the seers of the subtle through the refined and pointed intellect. There's another word called anaranyan in Sanskrit. It means the subtlemost of the subtle. That is, of what's extremely subtle, I want to know the subtlemost of the subtle. So that's that underlying substratum, the kutasta. It's the intelligence residing in all that is unreal, from Lord Brahma down to an ant. Unreal means all that took a form, because forms are essentially all soluble into the formless Brahman like a sugar cube into tea, all soluble. They don't die, they dissolve back into their essence. You can't add anything to the katasta. You can't take anything away from the katasta. It's ever full. 400,000 beings could die in a tidal wave. The katasta would remain exactly the same as it was. No alteration whatsoever on any level. Physical, when the bodies died, Energy, when the prana uh, left the body, thought and mind, when the brain passed away, and spirit, Atman, the same, would remain the same in all circumstances under all conditions, because it's beyond all circumstances and conditions. That's why they call it katasta, underlying substrat. It's the eternal foundation of all things that take form. It's undifferentiated presence in and as the intelligence of all beings. Important word in our English language, undifferentiated. An undifferentiated mass of pure conscious awareness. Chidgana. An undifferentiated mass of pure conscious awareness. It's all kutasta in that way. It's all Brahman, like saying, Jo kucha hai so tu hai tu ju se hai dil ko lagaya Jo kucha hai so Trace it back until it's subtle most essential kutasta and find it to be pure conscious awareness, timeless, deathless consciousness. You'll run out of words pretty soon, especially in the English language. Well, here's four that kind of convey that idea to you that all this squawk that's going on for eons around astute philosophical, philosophical systems like this are all pointing to that one thing, Joku Chahai. I have finally understood, O oh Lord, that all is Brahman. Everywhere, there's nothing but Brahman. That's what he's saying. 
somebody finally sat down. It's called a gajal in India. It's a song that um, is sort of semi-classical, and it's become very, very known because it's very difficult to sing, for one thing, you could probably imagine by my attempt, and also relates this superlative particle of essential wisdom to you, like a mantra. I finally understood that all is Brahman. I don't need anything more. Thank you, every world. Thank you, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Thank you, everything from avatar down to ant. I'm fine now. I'm healthy. I'm the Atman. I'm a true human being now. What I should have always been. What I always was, and from now on always will be. <laughs> so, these kinds of sentiments, if you want to call it that, spiritual sentiments, come forth when you just say a certain word like that, kutasta. How about antaryami? Here you're getting to a little bit more bhakti-oriented feel, sort of more love and devotion here. Antaryami means, in the best English translation I've ever heard of it, uh, from an old Vedanta teacher named <coughs> Mr. Eli Morosi, whom I had the privilege of spending time with, he said, it means the inner ruler immortal seated in the heart. The inner ruler immortal seated in the heart. And witnessing everything. If it's there in the heart chakra, then it can witness everything that's going on in the three lower chakras. Eating, drinking, and sex life. Ancestors, humans, and animals, and insects. Everything that's going on in the lower three chakras. It can also look inward and see everything in inward ascension that's going on at the throat chakra where I'm speaking from right now, and from this third eye chakra and from this crown chakra. See, three above, three below. There's your triputti again. And then there's this central basis right in the middle where the heart dwells, so where the Atman dwells in the heart. Ara, Eva, Ratanabal, Samhatra, Yatra, Nadyaha, Sha, Ishon, Chascharate, Bukhura, Jayamanaha, Om, Ityevam. Jayatha Atmanam, Svastivaha, Parayaha, Tamasaha, Parastata. There at the center, in the heart, where all the thousands and thousands of subtle nerve endings meet, like the spokes of a chariot wheel at the hub, abides my Atman. Everyone but becoming manifold. Meditate upon that as Om, Omik Jevam Jayatha Atmanam. Meditate on that Atman as Om, and God speed to you in crossing over to the farthest shore, beyond all darkness. Does it sound like uh, they were only austere non dualists? Or were they also poets? Were they also deeply in love with God? And did they also call it not only a sort of sterile substratum word, but they also called it by the inner ruler immortal seated in the heart. Yeah, with great devotion. Huh? Mm. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't write beautiful songs like this. Shri Ramachandra Kripal Vajamana form of God that the human mind can comprehend. The avatar, avatar, who came in the form of Ram, Ma, Krishna in this day and age to remind us of all these great teachings. I'm simply his humble disciple. So if I say antaryami, I would be saying something like, the inner ruler immortal seated in the hearts of all beings, free of all differentiations. It's seated in the hearts of all beings, but is not the ego. Not getting involved in your ego. He doesn't have a plan for your life. 
He's telling you instead, don't you know there is no meaning to life? Everyone's lost here. Everyone's living in pallid imitation of everyone else. Haven't you seen that? Every day, don't you see it? Waking, dreaming, deep sleep, do it all again. And all the time not knowing what you're doing. As you wake and dream and fall into deep sleep, you don't know that aham brahmasmi, aham nirvikalpa, that I am Brahman, that this is going on under my own auspice, that I am that, tattvamasi, that that thou art. How is that possible? What kind of a, a cloud of nations has fallen? What kind of a mask have I pulled over my own eyes? See, that I don't know this. <clears throat> How can I allow that to happen? Let death rob me. Rob my inner peace and self-control. Instead I should be singing Samo Damo Dui your witness consciousness, your inner ruler immortal seated in your heart. On this journey of life, there are many robbers. Keep the sentries, Samo and Damo, as sentries, as protectors, so that your belongings will not be stolen. Your precious belongings mean memory of yourself. All these things that are part of your wisdom particle are your most precious possessions. You should never be without those. Let's see if we can think of some here. Peace of mind. How about that one? Have you lost your peace of mind? Holy Mother Shisharda Devi said, nothing should ever cause you to forget your peace of mind. Give up everything in order to retain that. Because if you lose your peace of mind, then nothing else makes any sense. No feigned relationship with family and home relatives, children, it doesn't make any sense anymore if you're not at peace. And no, neither will it do them any good. You're hurting both sides of the faction. So, samo damo tui, O mind, return to your own home, your eternal abode, your inner ruler immortal seated in your heart. The quote here about it is, that individual soul is as subtle as a hair point divided and subdivided hundreds of times, yet it is potentially infinite. It has to be known. Beyond gender, whatever body it assumes, it identifies with that. So that Antaryami, Sri Krishna has talked about it in the Gita as bees taking, uh, lighting on different flowers, taking different scents from different flowers, the wind taking scents from flowers and distributing them all around. That's the antaryami. Nobody sees that as it takes consciousness from bodies and deposits them into other bodies, like, like bees take honey from different flowers or the wind takes scents from the orchard and deposits them around the world, you see. That's that inner ruler immortal seated in the heart, doing everything but doing nothing all seeing, but no one seeing it. Mm -hmm. Thousands of eyes, thousands of hands, thousands of feet. Nobody, but, but, but the owner and possessor of all those, nobody knowing it. It knows all, nobody knows it. So the Antaryami is all of that. It's interwoven in all, like the thread which runs through a string of pearls. You don't walk up to some fine lady dressed in a nice animal fur with a thousand dollar gown on and a necklace of fine pearls and say, well, I really like your thread. <laughs> See, who does that? Really like that thread in your necklace, lady. <laughs> but that's what the yogi would be thinking. What holds everything together? What's the glue, the cosmic glue and everything? Well, we have one more word 
care to take in this chart on the four levels of Brahman subtlety in accordance with this Sakshi Chaitanya witness consciousness, which is an integral part of your wisdom particle. It's called the Pratyagatman. The quote on it is, that is the substratum, the bliss, the indivisible consciousness in whom the three worlds dissolve. Realizing the Atman abiding in the heart, partless, secondless, beyond existence and non-existence, one attains that Pratyagatman. They associated it with that word Paramatman, the Supreme Self. In the last quote at the level of the Antaryami, we heard that it comes and goes and so forth. It's at a qualified non-dual level. It's this witness that um, we, we uh, can catch a glimpse of, as it were, in our deepest meditations. But the level of the Pratyagatman, they don't assign any of that, like movement or coming and going. That's why Vivekananda said coming and going is all nonsense. Where would the Atman come from and where would it go when it's all pervading? So a, a, a nice word in English language, all pervading or all pervasive. So this Pratyagatman is a homogeneous mass of consciousness free of all limiting adjuncts. More English words that the Vedanta says put together for you. All limiting adjuncts. It's also the entity thou, that which is, of the nature of pure conscious awareness. Whereas my teacher used to say, everyone's aware of the, of the objects, see, uh, the uh, finite objects, but nobody's aware of the uh, eternal subject you must become aware of the eternal subject. So this is what reminds me of we say, it is the entity thou, that which is. Pure conscious awareness. 100% uh, sentiency. No falling out in it. No sleep. No delusion. No adjuncts. That is, no conditions to it. Like sleep waking and birth death and those kinds of things. That's what Advaita wants you to identify with. As a quote from the Koivalya Upanishad up top says, that which is the supreme Brahman, the soul of all, the great support of the universe, called Ati Sukshma, subtler than the most subtle and eternal, that is thyself, and thou art that. That's a turn of phrase for you. They get you thinking in the first few words that, oh, there's something out there that's great. But then they turn it back on you, don't they? Thou art that. That is you. That is your true self. That's awakening. That's spiritual awakening when you hear that. And according to some teachers like Buddha, you have awakened when you hear that already. You are spiritually awake now. As soon as you hear it, it's just a matter of what kind of revolution is it going to cause in this mind? Or you might put it this way, how solidified and how dense is that mind complex? How long is it going to take me to break it apart? Because you can wait for it to break your mind apart with Alzheimer's or loss of memory or old age, or decay of the brain. Or you can break it apart yourself right now. <laughs> the, uh, the advantage to the latter alternative is that you will know you're the witness. You're the one doing it. And so you won't suffer later Alzheimer's, decay of the brain, and so forth. I've seen it myself. Some of the older teachers of my forget me when they have a heart attack, come to them. Namaste, here I am, I've come to see you, and they look at me. Well, not there in the mind anymore. But I've come to know that in their case, they've identified with the Atman long ago, for many lifetimes. So when the body and brain doesn't have its facility anymore, they simply abandon it. And this is the import of Sri Krishna's saying, that the wise, the enlightened souls, take on and give up bodies as easily as a child outgrowing sets of clothes as he grows up. They're doing it all the time consciously. So that which is the supreme Brahman, the soul of all, the great support of the universe, right there he said in that one statement, the Koivalya Upanishad has mentioned two of these four. And he goes on to say it's called Ati Sukshma. Ati means original. There can be no more, uh, uh, nothing before it. Sukshma means subtle. It's the original subtle being. 
There can be nothing anterior to it, as we were saying. And good to end with the final quote on this chart. Like clay in pots, like gold in ornaments, like thread in fabric, it is subtle like these. That Brahman is the antecedent, all-pervading consciousness in all. So they will come down to the level of analogy to try and help you understand. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, clay elephant, clay mouse. Very, a lot of difference in mass, right? But not in essence. Mm -hmm. So, like that, Atman is in everything. It's in the insect, it's in the subatomic particle, it's in the human being, it's in the intelligent particle. It's the one thing that doesn't change in it all. You should come to know that. Because then you will be Sakshi Chaitanya, the witness of all phenomena, of all changing phenomena. I wanted to show you this chart on the four levels of subtlety of Brahman, especially for those who are looking at my classes live stream and saying, well, he's not really saying much about Advaita yet. <laughs> he's talking all around it nicely, but basically, as I said in at least two of the last four classes, that it's barely impossible to talk about the Advaita, right? it's to talk, to point it out. It's, it's so subtle as we've just been saying. So these words will give us the closest avenue possible to being able to understand it intellectually and then we have to take that intellectual understanding and convert it don't we convert it into a deeper understanding and that's the business of your intelligent particle you have to bring those to bear you have to turn that spotlight on you have to get that stream flowing or better yet become aware that it always is flowing but you're not taking part in it yet they say get with the flow, right, nowadays? So in spiritual circles, we're going to say get with the intelligent flow. What you're hearing here on the outside, you don't hear around in other houses in the neighborhood. You don't hear it going to work. You don't hear it anywhere except in spiritual circles. And I'd probably be easy to say that you won't hear this teaching anywhere but in my ashram. As this is something I've put together for you to consider from my own meditations, from the teachings of my guru, my teachers, and from the reading the non-dual scriptures, what I've been able to gather for you, and put it in a way that makes it a hands-on practice for us, that we can participate in our own awakening, in our own enlightenment, and do it in this very lifetime. Now, with the remaining 10 minutes, probably don't want to start into a new chart, but I can pick up on this chart so that we use the time wisely. That is, we have about 10 minutes at most left, and this the import again of this word OM with its triple designations is even expanded further here, if you can see it. Basically, we see all the designations that could fit in this format of an 8 by 11 uh, right there before us. Mm -hmm. That is, we've already talked about waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. That's certainly one of the most important of all assignments in OM. But you can see others there too. Basically, you can see right across the board here, underneath the three letters, A is Brahma, U is Vishnu, M is Shiva. We said that already. We can also talk about it in terms of the three worlds and the three bodies. That is, immanent, transcendent, and absolute. Those are the three words that suggest themselves in English. Immanent, transcendent, and absolute. That is, there's an immanent world right here, gross world. There's a, uh, a transcendent world, the world of our mind, which we cannot see with the outer senses. It's going on in our head. The senses are actually connected back into it. And then there's an absolute world, which is there after all things dissolve. Shiva's work uh, in back into the final mantra. Waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, we've suggested. Speech, life force, and mind is another triputi that goes with the word om. 
of this speech, we talked about that um, food in terms of how it becomes speech when it gets digested. Here we talk about it in terms of the A of OM, that is, all utterances. You might have noticed on the computer that your A key wears out the quickest. There's so many A's and so many words. It's one of the quickest first to go, and also it's right next to the cap lock. So you have to be careful not to touch the cap lock because you get just a little off, then you'll have a whole sentence full of capital letters. And with all their brilliance, they haven't been able to just push a button and turn it all into lowercase yet. You have to go back and type the whole thing over. So A is right next to the cap lock, and it's used so often. So A is a very powerful word. It's very imminent. It's very associated with words and speech. The U, life force. Life force sustains everything, so that's Vishnu's work. So it's this life force, the prana, sustains all things. It's the man does not live by bread alone subtlety that we're not noting. We think that man lives by bread alone. If we stop eating, we die. Not always the case. Uh, we can live on very little. But what we need to do is imbibe that prana. And we need to imbibe it in a pure form see, and take it up, use it for something. That is ojas and tejas, as we were talking about. So that life force is a very important part. It goes with the U of Om, and mind goes with M. And if we flash back to the Gyanamatra chart, we'd see that mind is involved in the projection, sustenance, and withdrawal of the universe. They used to call that creation, preservation, and destruction. But I think it's good to change it to projection, sustenance, and withdrawal. Because there is no birth and no death and certainly no life without Brahman. There's only eternal life. And that's what Christ was trying to get us interested in, those of us who were with him. It's not such a far stretch of the, even the imagination to think so. Sri Ramakrishna in the 1800s was watching his students, young students, uh, dance and sing the names of the Lord. And he, as he saw them, he said, oh, I see that several of those, I've just realized that several of my disciples were with Christ before in his entourage. So these souls that attend upon the avatar called uh, avatar of Adis, they, they follow the path of the divine incarnation each time it comes to earth. Some of those are the same soul. They're coming back again to be right with the avatar when the cutting edge of that wisdom shears through the relative universe in Maya and brings a great light here. Sri Ramakrishna himself said, for two or three hundred years after I pass, the curtain of Maya will still be lifted, and people can get under it and get to the Father through the Son, if you want to. That's, he didn't say that, but you know who said that. So uh, there's a, a great wake left by a huge steamship. Some of those boys out there get on surfboards and just ride that wake in the eternal wave, you see. They got, they've got some boldness going. You see. So Sri Ramakrishna used to say, piece of wood, log, maybe carry one or two people across the river. A canoe or rowboat, five or six. Uh, a ferry, a hundred. But a steamship can carry hundreds and hundreds of beings. So these great manifestations called avatars have these Ishvara Kotis attending upon them, they come back again from age to age, from yuga to yuga, yuge, yuge, cha dharmasha, if you want the exact sutra in the Gita, to uh, save living beings from, as Ram Prasad used to sing in his songs, the illusion of finitude. Because you can't really save them, because they're already Brahman, they're already Atman, isn't it? So you come back to, a, to save them from the dream of finitude. Wake up, wake up, you must, you must. Don't you all know that everything's dead here? Everything's masquerading as something else? Uh, open your eye of wisdom, see the truth. And live that way, and live in the truth. As you were saying, is at the break, one of the students said, born free is a contradiction, but the sequel was live free. So, that's more like living in the Atman. That's true freedom. That's Jivan Mukta. He just sang about that. See? Jivan Mukta. Now, onwards, in the remaining five minutes, mother is A, father is U, Guru is M. 
That is, mother creates, as it were, out of the womb, and then father sustains with his protection. Guru destroys everything in the end. Poof. Can't take anything with you. Destroys your ignorance around thinking that you can. And then you're free when you leave the body. And if you come back again, hopefully you remember that guru helped you in the previous lifetime and you run to him again. Even the greatest beings had gurus. They all went to their guru as soon as they could. I mean, some beings like Dalai Lama have it down so pat that they find their gurus before they're even two years old. You might have heard. One day you've got this nice little baby and some strange bald-headed people in funny colored robes knock on the door and say, can we have that child? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dangle a few objects in front of it. Goo goo, ga ga, that's mine. What are you doing with my hair comb? I was bald, but I still had a comb. <laughs> so people remember from past lifetimes. See, these beings remember it because they've, they've, they have their intelligence cell wall strong, resilient against all forgetfulness, against all ignorance. They don't brood their time away. They don't perceive objects as being real, so they don't put any time and invest any energy in them. It's all vested inside. If everything that I've said, and I'll keep continuing to say for the rest of my life as long as I draw breath, and that I've been studying for all my lifetime doesn't convince you, this, this huge mass of teachings, where did it come from if not from intelligence? Not from living intelligence. It's not like there aren't tomes and tomes of books in libraries about secular knowledge. So fine, let it be that way. But there are also tomes and tomes of wisdom, scriptures, and teachers, and luminaries who live at the level of the Gyanakasha, at the, live at the level of the intelligent particle, and so you go find them. You, you find your way, you beat a hasty retreat from Maya, and you find a, a path to their door. If, if, if if a woman has a baby and the house breaks in fire, she doesn't stop to make an escape plan. She finds the first way out. She's got precious cargo. She'll kick the door down or the wall down if she has to. So that's like the, the, the uh, aspirant who's remembering he has a soul. And a soul that's imminent, transcendent, and absolute, all three. And he's got to guard it. He's got to protect it. There's a lot of state there. Feminine, masculine, neuter, activity, balance, and inertia. Very nicely assigned to Om. Past, present, and future. That's a good one. And I think next week, as we have to end here, I will start you off on the Triputi chart because these Triputis are very important to uh, our realization in Vedanta. Gross form, subtle form, causal form. These are the A, U, and M of Om. This chart and the Triputi chart I'll probably start off next week when we gather here again or, or gather at, uh, at a nearby location, which will still be live streamed. And so you're all invited to attend there. And we will uh, love to see you, whether you're in form or formless. <laughs> we'll love to see you, see or not see you. Um, so here, let's end with a quick chant. Om Badram Karnabihi Srinayama Devaha Badram Pasyema Akshabirya Jatraha Stirai Rangayish Tushtuvam Sastanavir Vishema Devahitam Yadayuhu May we see with these eyes what is good and spiritual, hear with these ears what is noble and uplifting, and may we, while worshipping the Lord and Mother of the Universe with healthy minds and bodies, live a life which is beneficial to ourselves and to all other beings. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tat Sat. <laughs>